And that's really the heart of the book. I do it for those diagnostic categories. It's the first one, instead of looking at short term or looking at side effects, how is it affecting the long term course? And then the other possibility, and I do it also, I also look at childhood disorders, ADHD, what the long term outcomes are, depression, and bipolar. So that's one thing. Here's the other possibility of what's going on that we need to look at. Is it possible that you can take people with a milder problem, let's say a mild bout of depression, they come and get treatment and they get put on, let's say, an antidepressant. Might it be that some people will have sort of a bad response to that antidepressant, let's say a manic episode, and therefore they'll move to the bipolar case. In other words, they'll have a manic episode response to the antidepressant. Then they end up in the bipolar camp. Now, once they're in the bipolar camp, if this is happening, you know, that's a much more serious disorder. It obviously often comes with a cocktail of medications. And you can see that could be an iatrogenic pathway to fueling this disability. And there is one quite a history that we need to look at today. Why are, why, if you look at what's fueling the disability numbers, it really is affecting disorders. That's depression and bipolar, and it's really bipolar. Bipolar used to be a rare disorder. But all of a sudden now, today in the United States, bipolar is said to affect 1 in 50 people. 40 years ago, it was somewhere between 1 in 3,000 and 1 in 10,000. So how did we get this bipolar rule? If we went back 20 years ago, juvenile bipolar illness was said not to affect children under 13. Before that, very rarely, really before 18. And as you know, we've had this extraordinary boom in juvenile bipolar diagnostics. So these are the questions that are being raised in this book and investigated in this book. And I think we can all, I think we can agree, it's, these are questions that need to be asked, they need to be investigated, they need to be understood, and then they need to be made as part of the public discussion, like we're having here tonight, and which thankfully we had here uh, this afternoon. And then if we find that things aren't going so well, we can use this information to argue for change. That can be evidence for change and doing things differently and helping people really get well. And that's really the, the hope of this book. Um, I, I want to say one thing, one big disclaimer, real quick. What we are looking at in this book is how are outcomes affected in the aggregate, okay? And that does not mean that I honestly believe that there are some people that are helped by psychiatric medications, or there are many people helped by psychiatric medications over the short term. I certainly have seen that in terms of the stress. And I also believe there are some people who do well on them long term. And nothing I should say tonight should, uh, dis should, uh, should dispute that in your own minds. And if you're a person who's taking medications and they're working well for you, fantastic, great, wonderful. No one wants to take that away from anybody. This is what this is, and no one should take what I'm going to say tonight as medical advice, okay? It's not that, do not act on anything I say. We're just looking at this big societal picture. Is this paradigm of care working, okay? It's not about individual, because people have different responses, that's sort of thing. Does that make, does that make? Okay, one quick thing, and this is my big little story. So how did I end up doing this? In 1998, um, and it's also, begin where my belief in the common wisdom began to fall apart. In 1998, I was doing a series for the Boston Globe on uh, uses of psychiatric patients in research settings. And one of the things we looked at in that series was withdrawal studies, studies where they had withdrawn antipsychotic medications from schizophrenia patients to see how quickly they would relapse. And the, the context of, that, of our series was that was extraordinarily abusive and unethical. And the reason our context was for that was, for that, was that we understood, well, I said we, there was two reporters working on the story, is that the drugs were like insulin for diabetes. They fixed the dopamine imbalance in the brain. You would never withdraw insulin for a diabetic, so why would you do this for someone with schizophrenia? We thought it was quite abusive. That's what we were getting ready to write. And in fact, it sort of did like it. So at one point, I called up David Oates, and I was expecting this was my kind of yeah, I'm going to get a spokesman for consumers and he's going to say, yeah, that's outrageous. How could you possibly ever withdraw medications? And David says, you need to look at this a little more. That's what I said. And he sort of challenged me. He said, the stories that you've been told, those are sort of stories. You need to dig into the literature. And he really challenged me to see 
go through the science, find out really what the story is there. So really, I'm not sure I can hear it, but one thing we did, so maybe I can either thank you or blame you. I'm not sure. <laughs> So real quickly on this, uh, I'm not going to go in uh, too deeply into the chemical imbalance story, but I think we need to do it real quickly, and here's why. That's part of the belief system, is that these drugs fix something in the brain, right? And we really want to know is if we start seeing these drugs in the new light, is do they do that? And if not, what do they do? And we also want to know, when people go to that initial, initial moment of diagnosis, do they, quote, have a physical, biological problem? Okay, do they have both of those in brain or not? Because that can tell you something very different. So where did the chemical imbalance theory of mental disorders arise? It arose in the 1960s, and it arose not from any understanding of what was happening to, to, to people so diagnosed. It arose from an understanding of how the drugs acted on the brain. So for example, researchers came to understand that antipsychotics, Thorazine and the other standard antipsychotics, block dopamine receptors in the brain. And if you all remember how, uh, how neurons communicate in the brain, one neuron releases the neurotransmitter, right, into the synaptic cleft, the gap, and then the molecule binds on the second, on the receptor on the second neuron, on the postsynaptic neuron. What antipsychotics do is they block the receptors for dopamine, about 70% of them. Okay, so since antipsychotics block the dopamine receptors, researchers hypothesized, well, maybe people with schizophrenia have too much dopamine. So that's how that hypothesis arose. The second part of the, uh, the hypothesis really what had to do with depression, and just to sort of leap forward, let's look at the low serotonin theory of depression. That arose from understanding that antidepressants block, they, they kept serotonin longer in that synaptic cleft. Okay. Now, normally what happens when, when serotonin goes into that synaptic cleft, it has to be removed pretty quickly for the signal to be you know, sharp and, and quick. And the serotonin is removed in one of two ways. Either an enzyme comes along, metabolizes it, and those metabolites are carted off as waste, or the molecule is, it goes back up into the presynaptic neuron. What Prozac does is block the reuptake of that serotonin. That keeps the serotonin longer in the synaptic cleft, so people theorized, if it's keeping serotonin longer, maybe people with depression have low serotonin. But the theory arose not from investigations into depressed patients, okay? I think this is key. Okay, now those two hypotheses, in fact, were investigated in the 1970s. And early 1980s is when the, the heart of the investigations were done. So let's take the low serotonin theory of depression. Remember I just said that that serotonin is, is removed in two ways. One is either back up into the presynaptic or it's broken, it's, an enzyme comes along and turns it into metabolites. Well, researchers said, aha, we can look for metabolites in the cerebral spinal fluid and we can measure levels of metabolites. And if there's low serotonin levels in the brains of the breast patients, they should have low metabolite levels. See how that, the logic is there? So they did those measurements. And here's what they found. They found that people with depressed patients had sort of a bell curve of metabolite levels. And a bell curve means it was variable. Some people at the low end, some people in the middle, and some people at the high end. It was very variable. Then they compared that range of metabolites to, to quote, healthy people, non-depressed people, and they had the same bell curve. There was no statistical difference. Then they said, okay, but nevertheless, we have this bell curve, and we have this group of people at the low end of that bell curve. And there was one study that said, it seems like there's more suicidal ideation in this low end of the bell curve. So they hypothesized, well, maybe that's the group that really responds to antidepressants. And that's, again, that would be that the sense that the, the drug, at least in that group, is fixing a chemical imbalance. So in 1984, the NIMH ran such a study designed to see that. They measured metabolite levels, and they hypothesized there were people to be at the low end of the bell curve, that would respond better to the drug and they found it didn't matter. Those at the high end were just as likely to respond to the antidepressant as the low end. And so believe it or not, in 1984, the NIMH said, it doesn't look like there's a perturbation of the serotonergic system that's responsible for depression. That was in 1984. In 1987, Prozac was brought to market and this whole story with the smiling things that appeared on the news and all, about low serotonin was done really as a marketing thing. It was a way to market Prozac as 